We've all been to a doctor's office or even a hospital, but that experience doesn't make us think we know a lot about effective medical practice. But here's what gets me. I have conversations with people all the time about effective educational practice, and it seems to me that just because we've been in school, uh, we feel like we know a lot about effective instruction. Now, we should have our opinions and we should have discussions, but what I want to raise today is some thoughts about maybe being a little bit more humble about those opinions and thinking hard about how we could open our minds to new possibilities that careful analysis, data, and new science could reveal about effective instruction. Technology is wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> I care about improving education because I believe it's the core of social progress. And I have a real passion and enthusiasm about educational technology in the 21st century, not just because of the cool and individualized and powerful things that well-designed educational technology can do, but because of the potential that the data that's being collected from these educational technologies can provide to give us new insights about improving education. I want to argue today for a strategy for educational improvement that starts with these premises. Better education requires better theory. Better theory requires vastly more data than we have, and educational technology can provide that data for us. Let me go back to this question about why it's so tempting to think we know a lot about effective teaching. And one of the reasons is we have this impression that we know what we know. It almost sounds like, you know, a rose is a rose. We know what we know, duh. Well, I want to suggest that we don't know always a lot about what we know. Let me give you an example. So we all are English speakers. You've had lots of experience with the English language. You might say, you know the English language. I might believe you. But do you know what you know? Do you know the definition of the word the, for instance? I bet you never learned the definition of the word the. Can you tell me why in that first bullet there's a the in front of English, but there's not in the second bullet? You have no problem generating that or recognizing that it would be sound wrong to switch them, right? But you've learned a lot about English without explicitly knowing those things. There's a lot going on underneath the, our conscious awareness in, in the learning process. This is kind of an insidious thing when it comes to instructional design. We've heard this phrase, experience is the best teacher. I want to suggest that it's not the best teacher. It's a good teacher, but it's not the best. And I want to give you an example of some research on expertise in a strange area, chick sexing. That's right, I said chick sexing. So there are experts <laughs> that figure out what newborn chicks, what sex they are, and they turn them over and they look at their genital regions uh, there's, apologies, any children here in this <laughs> chick porn here? Uh, you have to figure out what is that, what is that, right? And they do this amazingly quickly and amazingly effective. Thousands of chicks in an hour, 98% uh, correct. Uh, but they have trouble articulating what it is that they're doing. Uh, they'll say, uh, there's thousands different of types, you just have to learn it. And the training of this tends to be a kind of sit by Nelly and watch what she do, does approach, right? That's the standard of on-the-job training. Well, there were these psychologists who went in and analyzed what experts were doing, and they were able to isolate some key features that allow this distinction to be made. And they created a one-page instruction, had some abstracted diagrams that, isol that pinpointed those key features and described them. And they were able to show that about a minute of instruction, they got complete novices to about equivalent performance as these experts. So experience is not the best teacher. Well-designed instruction is the best in teacher. And what do I mean by well-designed instruction? I mean instruction that's informed by an analysis of human performance data. Experts 
learners. What is it that they know? What is it that they don't know? Slow the process down, look at it closely. It offers insights, it changes instruction. Many studies in other domains, um, technical domains, medical domains, learning to use spreadsheets, maybe not as sexy as those other studies that I just mentioned, but powerful studies repeatedly shown redesigned instruction leads better and usually faster and easier instruction than existing instruction. Where that in existing instruction is created by professionals, like in that second example, those are medical professionals who created the instruction that was be being taught to medical interns. This carefully redesigned instruction improved upon it quite dramatically. So you might think, well, those look like new technical domains that we don't teach a lot. What about something we've been teaching for years, like algebra? Can we redesign that? Can we make it better? It would seem like they must have figured it all out by now. Let me give you an example from my own research where we were interested in understanding how students struggled. Uh, I was interested in particularly in how they struggled with story problems. And I made this contrast. You can see these three problems have the same numbers in them. They all have the same answer. We gave quizzes to students that had problems like this. And the question is, which of these problems is most difficult? So lowest percent correct for an algebra student, say, in March of, of their first year of algebra. Any thoughts? Who, who thinks the story problem is most difficult? Can I get a show of hands? How about the word problems? How about the equations? You got a pretty good mix. Who doesn't raise their hand when they're asked to? <laughs> yeah. um, here's what we found. First of all, we surveyed teachers and math education researchers on this same question, essentially. They think the story problems are the hardest. That's what I thought when I did this study. But that ain't true. Um, what we found is that students did better on the story problems and the word problems than they did on the equations. Teachers think their students are going to translate the story problem to equation and solve it. But in fact, what many students end up doing for these problems is they bring their common sense and intuitions to bear to produce correct solutions without equations, sometimes arguably more efficiently than with the equations. When we look in contrast at some of their attempts at these equations, we see that it doesn't look like they can even read the problem, if you will. So here's an interesting thing. It, it's almost as if the algebra is a foreign language. And if you think about it, it kind of is, right? And just like English, we learn languages without being aware of it. So why do the teachers get it wrong? It's in part because they don't know what they've learned. They weren't aware of all the details of the algebra language, that they were picking it up because their brain was soaking it up. Uh, what was particularly striking about this phenomenon, which we've called expert blind spot, is that we looked at teachers at different levels asked this question. It was the high school teachers who teach algebra who were most likely to get it wrong. Because for them, the algebra equations are really easy, right? So they think the student's going to be like them. But the student is not like me. That's a big message here. So I've talked about how data can influence theory. And what I want to turn to now is how educational technology can help us generate data. And I want to reflect for a minute on this uh, recent Netflix $1 million prize for improving on their movie rating system. Uh, folks know about this. Amazing effort over three years to improve their error rate, reduce their error rate on predictions of what you're going to like in a movie. So you give a five-star rating. This is what the data looked like. Uh, they wanted to re reduce that error rate by 10%. So the goal is to predict future ratings of the individuals, like their last two movies, using the data from all their previous ratings. So some of this is covered up. The guys have to uh, apply algorithms, statistical machine learning algorithms, to make that prediction. Now, this was the geeks had a field day with this, right? And it's a great puzzle for them. Uh, in fact, there's an estimate that about a million PhD hours went into this. <laughs> so what's that? A dollar per hour, Netflix paid PhDs to work on it. So great excitement. And there were a lot of interesting discoveries made about the, particularly about how movies change over time in terms of their ratings, how customers change their opinions over time. Um, things you would have never expected until this happened. So lots of data can really lead to new discoveries. 
But what I want to suggest is that we could do this kind of thing for something, I mean, I like movies, but could we do this for something that's more important, like improving education? So back to educational technologies. They're great sources that will feel better understanding of learning and learners by providing us with more data. And I have some examples of different kinds here. Uh, one of my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon is doing really neat stuff with English learning games on, on mobile phones in, uh, in, in countries around the world. I've focused on intelligent tutors for mathematics. I want to zero in on that a little bit here. Um, we've had great success in uh, getting these uh, products uh, in use around the country as part of a complete algebra course. The teacher is a very important component of this course, but the technology plays a component too in freeing the teacher to, to do things that they can do best. Lots of studies showing that it's effective, but I want to focus in on the data that's available. And to do that, I want to give you a sense for what students do. First of all, I want to emphasize that there's a big emphasis in, in this on engaging those common sense notions that we saw in those earlier solutions of the story problems. So there are problems here that try to connect to the real world for students on topics uh, we hope they care about uh, and help to care about, right? So lots of different things. Local facts about the pit population of Pittsburgh, for instance, smoking risks for women. Um, this one I like, the importance of math education for a future job. So these are algebra problems for students. Um, here's a familiar one. There's a screenshot from the tutor. Uh, which company should you buy a cell phone plan from with two different cell phone plans, different uh, um, per minute rates, different fixed rates? So um, in this tutor, they're going to work through different representations like a table. If they make an error here, the system's saying, you know, the current cost you said is 0.13 times the time, but you forgot the 1495 fixed cost, so the tutor jumps in, gives help. It'll also give hints along the way. Um, here's the student's final solution that shows different representations that they're using. The key I wanna, point I want to get to is all the data that's being collected here for individual moves that the student's making, different strategies that they take, but what concepts and skills are they bringing to bear? So let's go back to that Netflix as an analogy here. We have data like this where we have students, we have problem steps, and in the matrix this time it's not movie ratings, but it's whether they get those right or wrong. So the zero one, and we are engaging in a similar game. I wish we had a $1 million prize to give. Maybe, maybe we'll do that at some point. But we want to predict students' future success using the data from the past. And the same kinds of machine learning algorithms can be applied to this data. It's really surprising what you can do with this kind of data. We've used it to predict students' future test scores. And what's neat about this is that we can do it without having them take practice tests because they're just engaging in regular instruction, but behind the scenes, they're essentially getting assessed while they learn, right? And we can show that that data actually does a better job of predicting future performance than practice tests themselves. Because in part, we get how much you have to work to learn, which indicates, even when you get it wrong, something about what you may know. We're also able to detect from this, basically, timing data, right? Mouse, mouse clicks and typing when students are disengaged or when they're kind of trying to game the system and uh, furthermore discover features of the instruction or the interfaces that lead to this kind of engagement. So you can imagine this could be really important for redesigning the system. So I want to revisit this question, why is it so tempting to think we know a lot about effective teaching? I talked about we feel we know all about our own knowing and learning and in fact that's the conscious awareness level, but at a deeper level, there's much we don't know about our own learning. But there's another issue here, which is, I don't think the science is completely there. What's known isn't out there in practice enough, and there's much more that we don't know. So I want to give you a sense quickly here for that um, by indicating what kinds of options there are in instruction. We tend to think of two options, like we've got to give more help on the basics, direct instruction, or more challenge for understanding or constructivism. But are there really two choices? There's been a lot of publications that have been giving recommendations to, to, for instruction uh, that suggest that there are many more than two choices. And these publications come from credible sources, the Department of Ed, our National Research Council. And what I have here uh, is a sense of how many more options there really are 
in instruction. Uh, and I'm not going to go through these in detail, but what I want you to get a sense for is how many different choices the science needs to weed through to identify the wheat from the chaff here. And uh, there is so many, and I'm going to give you a number in a second. It's not two, that's my estimate. <laughs> so how do we do this? We need lots of data. The student's not like me. We need to figure out what the student is like. Uh, we need more intense focus on data-driven science to find out, and educational technology can help produce that data. Thank you very much.